not a test. This is rock and roll. Welcome at this Q&A session. It's today, the 14th of October. My name is Moran Pools, and we will talk about the documentary Headwind 21. Um, you can join the live chat during the whole session, and of course, we're um, we're keen to give feedback live as we speak. Um, and I'm already connected with Alexander Paul out of the north of Sweden. But before Alexander will give all answers, um, we just do a bit of a warming up and present those who already joined us the three minutes trailer of Headwind 21. Welcome to the wonderful forests around me. They are full of biodiversity, but it's all under attack. This is today and welcome to the future. You probably see behind me. I think we should do the story together. You know, justice is an easy word to pronounce, but it can be a hassle to receive when you're alone, right? So, yeah, this should save the planet. All these companies wanting to build wind farms here, where it's not windy, but it's remote. But this whole thing makes you mad, right? Uh, it makes me so angry, I, I don't have the words to describe it. So we went to Stockholm to ask questions. How will these wind farms fix climate change when they don't calculate the CO2 that they're going to save? A wind farm in a forest is a degraded land use. How can SCA manage that conflict without being true to itself? And it's always, it looks okay. It's not, it is okay. Does it give you concerns? I would like to take decisions that I know is, are built on uh, research. Uh, it creates new jobs, the wind powers. Who checks that the developers actually do what they promise at the beginning? Yeah. And everybody wants to do good. And do business. And that is double trouble. Greta, I'm doing a documentary film to save forests. You've spent almost three years now raising the alarm. Um, what do you think is the next step? Our world is bleeding and its future. But at some point, we're all going to look back and say, why were we such idiots? I think we just start right away and dig into all comments we received. Alexander, I guess the most asked question uh, I received, um, because the film has a sort of an open end, how are you doing? after the arrest, the phone call, and what exactly happened? Well, it's very kind that people are, uh, are concerned about my, my well-being. It's really important to, to note that the scene that you see with the police abducting me, it was an abduction. It wasn't actually an arrest. I was not arrested. I was intimidated for an hour, and then I was dumped uh, about five kilometers from where they picked me up. Uh, the charge was uh, a corona-related charge, breaching the rule of eight uh, during the corona time, despite the fact that you could go shopping without a mask in Stockholm uh, and do many things. You were not allowed to, uh, to demonstrate or um, raise awareness, as, as I had done. The entire purpose, actually, there's a bigger story that it's probably worth... 30 seconds of reflection on. The day before I had been here locally in a place called Hammerstrand where the local municipality have their offices. And I was together with families uh, and we were doing a demonstration a protest, uh, technically illegal because it was more than eight people. It was not permitted, it was not allowed. No one paid any attention to us, not even the commune, not the police, to be perfectly honest. Some local people, 
took notes, um, but nothing happened. And then the next day, there happened to be uh, the Freedom Day events back in March of 2021. Uh, and I thought there were people who are coming together to who questioned the narrative, uh, a different narrative, but at least they were open-minded people. I didn't have much luck with uh, the media uh, covering the story, you know, fraud, corruption. The media wasn't covering it. So I thought I'd go, go to Stockholm, talk to people who were already open-minded. Hopefully there would be cameras there, uh, et cetera. I didn't think anything more of it, having had a, a benign experience here in, in Ragunda. I went down. I met lots of lovely people, you know, grannies who knit, uh, families with their children, uh, lots of lovely people. None of them had heard about the wind farm corruption in the north, uh, but they were very receptive and very open minded. Uh, and I had spent the day just wandering around, talking to people, uh, you know, raising awareness. Everyone was asking me, as you saw in the clip, hey, what is this about? I didn't know about this, this these wind farms. You know, they're supposed to be good. Uh, and it was then that I was in silence abducted um so there was no there was no warning you know some people said i was asking for it some people said it was staged i mean it was completely unexpected on reflection uh having informed myself about what happened the tactics of the police etc i found out that it was a, it's a very common tactic at the moment where the police were intimidating people who were protesting uh predominantly questioning the narrative around the corona agenda uh, and that they were using these tactics to intimidate people and, and to deter them from, uh, you know, voicing their opinion against the narrative and against, uh, you know, the status quo. So, yes, I got caught up in something much bigger that I didn't realize at the time, but, uh, you know, I was as peaceful as they come. I was amongst many peaceful people, uh, and I heard that many other people were abducted the same way that I was and intimidated. In the end, the telephone call was because when I was abducted, I was, you know, I was in shock. I was uh, in disbelief. You know, I, who would have thought that the police who were supposed to protect you would do something like that? That I, I, um, I guess you'd say I flinched. Uh, I protected myself. Uh, I reacted as any person who believes that, you know, the, the police and the government are there to protect you would react. And in Sweden, and I believe in other countries, that's considered a crime. And the crime that I ended up being accused of, uh, suspicion of, uh, is called violently resisting a public official. So this is not limited to the police. So it wasn't violently resisting arrest. It's a much broader and very bizarre uh, sort of piece of legislation founded in, founded in a reasonable context. If the police uh, arrest you according to you know, human rights and, and common decency and you resist and fight back, et cetera, uh, you know, that's, that's not allowed, but it's being misused in very, very strange ways. And, and during those conversations of which you only saw one in the film, there was only one, but there were five. Uh, you know, I, they tried to coerce me into pleading guilty. They tried to coerce me into taking a fine. I just pay some money and it will go away. So it was a very strange experience, which left me scarred. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of the police now. Uh, I know there are good, many, many good people left in the police, but, you know, they, they do scare me because they seem to have no um, limitations. Uh, but also I feel empowered because I now know that, uh, you know, there's something funny going on. And, you know, I spoke to one of the officers in the van when they just drove me around. They did not take me to a police station or anything. I almost took, just took me down a side street and uh, intimidated me. They didn't formally question me, et cetera. Uh, you know, he was in pain, I think. You know, I think these police officers are being asked to do things uh, because they have mortgages, you know, just like I say in the film, you know, they've got bills to pay. And if they're told they need to do something uh, or risk, you know, being disciplined or losing their job, it's very difficult to stand up for what you believe in when you're a, a debt slave. And most people at the moment, sadly, are, are debt slaves to the system. I mean, your motivation in that scene was sort of climate related. The arrest, however, was part of a of a much broader agenda. 
and I believe it is, but do you think it's legitimate that I use this scene? Because clearly Greta Turnback was allowed to protest. Uh, 100%. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what I was talking about in certain respects. I sat in the vehicle. They asked me, are, are you a 5G tinfoil hat person? You know, they asked me really unreasonable things. And I explained to them, to the best of my ability, under duress that I had come to explain, you know, the, the corruption that was, you know, taking the police officers' pension funds, uh, you know, the, the forest, the future, etc. I was very clear that I was, what, what my purpose was, that it was an awareness raising exercise. Uh, there's even a photo, a mugshot, which, you know, I can share, which shows me standing there with two placards which clearly show that I'm talking about wind farm corruption. And at any point, the police could have decided, well, hey, you know, he's not the uh, anti-corona response narrative person. He's just gotten caught up in it. Uh, we'll take pity on him and, and we'll just ignore, you know, we won't press this uh, bogus charge of violently resisting but they chose to go after me anyway. So uh, yes, I mean, you know, it is, uh, if I would have been walking around in, in Stockholm on a random day, uh, who knows what would have happened because, you know, there wouldn't have been the same police presence, but I don't think this, the circumstances uh, corrupt the, uh, the, the value of that scene because uh, I was a peaceful, person, uh, you know, just raising awareness. Uh, I had my human rights completely abused and breached. Uh, and, you know, even after explaining, you know, if I was a police officer and I was trying to, you know, suppress COVID, uh, you know, people who question COVID, I wouldn't have then gone after someone who talks about wind farm corruption because, you know, they're not the audience that I was going after. But the fact that they persisted with me shows that there is, uh, you know, a much broader agenda that, you know, questioning the climate narrative is just one aspect. Uh, and, you know, with COP26, many countries are going to use that as an opportunity to uh, introduce very strict and extreme legislation around carbon emissions reductions and other climate-related uh, restrictions. You know, they're going to say there's going to be a carbon price, which is going to be another tax that will be imposed upon people. They will try to restrict our movement by saying that flights are now frowned upon. You shouldn't go use this amazing technology to see your friends and family uh, and explore and grow in the world. Uh, you should stay at home in front of your computer and so forth. So uh, I think that scene on its own without this explanation is uh, a thought provoking piece. And of course, this film is not just about wind power. It's not just about corruption and money, etc. It's also about getting people to think. And amazing is the number of people who questioned that scene. You know, they said, are you OK? Uh, was it real? Was it staged? Is it fake? So it, it served the purpose. But of course, you're 100 percent right to be true and honest. We need to give this explanation, which we're doing now. Let's talk about the situation in Sweden. Do you think the whole COVID attention and measures are sort of being used as a as a shadow for the bees to continue? I mean, you know, wind developers and lobbyists, they have business as usual, right? Uh, I, uh, it's a very challenging question because if you look at the press, uh, you would think that the world has stood still and nothing other than COVID happens. So COVID for me in certain respects, uh, and I don't want to go into the debate about the technicalities of COVID and the COVID responses, because that's worth a discussion and an open discussion, a probing and exploratory discussion on its own. It's distracting, you know, people have been doing so many things under the guise or under the, uh, the camouflage of COVID you know, the number of government uh, approved budget increases, you know, the number of pieces of legislation that people don't even see or don't even notice because they end up on page six because the first five pages are just COVID nonsense. The same COVID narrative repeated in five different ways every single day. 
So you have to go to page six to actually see what's going on in the world. Climate has become the same. You know, I'm engaging in, in conversations where all the people say is carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. It's almost as if it's a, a robotic response. And I'm saying, but you do know that carbon dioxide is just a node in a really complicated system, you know, a climate system, a, a natural system, an ecosystem. And if you're ignoring all these other points, um, you know, what are you actually doing? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make logical sense. So I do think that the COVID narrative is being used as a smokescreen uh, to, you know, a deer in headlights, if you, if you will, type uh, event that just blinds most people, uh, paralyzes them, and they lose their ability to critically think. And, and that's why I was so keen to make the film with you, Marijn, is that if nothing else, we just need people to think. And even if they already agree with something, they should still think about it again. Do I still agree? Uh, and if I change my mind, well, good for you. You've grown, you've learned. Uh, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. And it feels like people are feeling really guilty, you know, if the COVID response was not appropriate or perhaps even uh, inappropriate uh, and they bought into it, they would feel really bad. And the same thing goes for the climate. You know, if, if someone said this was super important, I used to believe in wind as a solution. Uh, I got new information, I changed my mind. I need to feel comfortable that, uh, you know, I've just changed my view of the world. That's okay. You know, we can get things wrong. Fear of failure is, is just a sign of growth. What kind of a feedback you generally received after the release of the film and how, how important is this film for you? It's been really interesting. I mean, other than a personal validation that, you know, I'm, I'm not crazy, uh, you know, that I'm not just a NIMBY, that I'm not just uh, a, a nepotist who, who wanted to make a film because, hey, isn't it so cool to have a film about yourself? It's been really uplifting to see that there are so many other people struggling, but for whatever reason, they didn't have access to the information or the network, or perhaps they, they just did things differently. So this film is becoming a, sort of a validation of their efforts you know, I got an email from Australia from a, a rainforest reserve. They're being, uh, it's a remote place. They want to build 95 wind turbines there. They said that they were in tears, you know, to know that there are people out there who are fighting for them. Uh, I got messages from the US. Uh, and what's amazing is that not all these messages are just, you know, pats on the back, thank you type messages. They're messages, I have information or you know, let's let's collaborate. Uh, and that is really positive for me because I felt very alone. Uh, but now I feel like I'm, I'm part of something much bigger. Uh, people are not all blinded. So this desire to actually look at nature as the foundation rather than technology as the foundation, that many people aspire to that now. Uh, I've also found groups of people who are using it as a tool so, you know, they're saying this is, this is really useful for us because it's really difficult to articulate to many people, particularly those who are pro-wind or um, who have no reason to believe that there's anything other than the most virtuous of intentions for the climate agenda. It's very difficult to articulate. And the film shows them in an accessible way uh, what's really going on. And yes, it is a perspective and there are different perspectives, but knowing what I know and having looked at the projects that I've looked at, I think it's difficult to find uh, or to say, uh, to debunk our film as being ludicrous and a fraud. Uh, sadly, it is the truth. And then the last group is, there's been a really interesting group of, of what I would call the haters or the, you know, the pro agenda people who find our film dangerous. And what I find uplifting there is um, some of the quality of some of the negative comments that have been coming out. You know, we wanted, we wanted to have a discussion and certainly uh, there has been a discussion both positive and challenging. And, uh, you know, I'm really pleased at the amount of effort that people are putting into their um, you know, displeasing comments. Um, one guy went into quite a technical 
review, uh, which I thought was very, very, you know, I was very flattered that he put in that amount of effort. Uh, there's a lot of gaslighting, you know, when someone just says this guy's an idiot or he's rich. Um, you know, if you've been here, Marine, you know that this is not about uh, a building a rich remote palace to escape. It's, it's about inclusion and accessibility and actually figuring out how we can live free uh, as in a financial context, but also sort of a physical and a, a sort of a mental con context. So it, it's been really positive and 83,000 people in two weeks with the media and Google, you know, sort of actively subduing the film, Google actively subduing is maybe a little bit extreme, but you know, all my media contacts went silent on the film. Uh, but, you know, we're knocking on doors, one individual at a time, one heart and one mind, uh, starting to think, starting to, you know, not only question, um, I guess you'd say the narrative, but also just, you know, exploring purpose and meaning and realizing that some of the, the world that I used to be part of, uh, that I have left, that it's not some exclusive thing that only a rich banker can do anyone can do this and uh, and so that's been really good it's been really really positive okay we we did a bit of a provoking scene while driving in sweden and talking about uh, we don't need more electricity which caused a bit of uproar and criticism and even though we talked about this off the record but not on screen could you explain a bit more about you know what you meant by it 100%. I'm, I'm solidly of the opinion that we have enough electricity uh, and enough energy on the planet. It's just how that energy is distributed and used. You know, a lot of our energy goes into pointless, energy intensive, heavy industry that, uh, you know, that we don't need. You know, this is just almost like an artificial uh, creation of demands, you know, more skyscrapers for the sake of skyscrapers. You know, if you take the amount of energy it takes to build a skyscraper, uh, you know, I'd love to do the maths, you know, millions of people could run their mobile phones, their lights, their computers, uh, their refrigerators, their basic um, technology uh, enabled conveniences for years. So, you know, to argue that we don't have enough energy um, on the planet uh, is, is false. Is it in the right places? Is it in the right form? Is it being used appropriately? 100% those are things that we need to work on. But if you think about it, an African person, and you know, Africa is, uh, is, is a continent that's really been abused, you know, and it's really been exploited and it continues to be exploited. And, and actually, you know, we can see how things are getting worse as China, the US and other, you know, industrials move in to exploit its, uh, its mineral uh, wealth. But you, you take someone who lives uh, remotely, uh, you know, he needs electricity for communication, you know, effective communications, for lighting, uh, they don't really need heating and cooling, they'll need refrigeration, and arguably they'll need something to, um, to assist them with their basic human needs around their work, and many of them are agriculture. So to facilitate that actually is not that much energy. The problem that we have is that we base our basic human needs of energy on our horrifically wasteful uh, cities and urban environments, which are not designed to be efficient. They're not designed to be autonomous or independent or even free. They're designed you know, electricity is designed to be something that you pay for, uh, and it becomes a, a financial model. And as you probably realize with other financial models, waste is money, because if you have to buy 10 times as much as you need, well, that's good for business. Not good for you, but it's good for business. So that scene was designed to really provoke people into thinking, what do I need energy for? Am I using it well? What about waste? Uh, you know, and, and if you want to know what waste looks like, just look at all the power lines that are strung across, you know, Western Europe, the United States, etc. That's all wasted energy because transporting electricity is horrifically wasteful, both in, in constructing and maintaining the infrastructure as well as actually moving electricity. 
So, you know, you can say whether whatever you like, um, a diesel car sitting on the driveway after a month is a diesel car with a full tank of gas, let's say. But an electric car sitting on the drive for a month, uh, you know, if you look at the Teslas, they can't even start them. You know, there's uh, Brian May is not Brian May. Um, uh, there was there's a skit on the on YouTube about uh, Tesla sitting on the drive for a month and the guy had to rip it apart to get the battery out because, you know, it has a parasitic load. Uh, so I love the fact that people picked up on that scene. You know, we've been I've been feeding back to a lot of people that the film isn't perfect, but that imperfection is designed to provoke thought. Uh, and even if it's a negative thought or a positive thought, as, as long as people are thinking. And I think a guy said, this scene is ridiculous because everything in this scene requires electricity. Um, what they didn't think about is that, you know, my dream car is uh, a Volvo 240, which is a car from the 1980s, which, you know, is uh, it's a bomb proof car. It's made of uh, metal. It's easy to fix. Uh, you know, it runs well. It does everything that a car needs to do. Um, and then I, I was in a, a Volvo V90, the latest model. Uh, a guy uh, came to visit me uh, and he had one. And it was the Starship Enterprise. You can't fix anything. Everything is susceptible. Lots of plastic electronics that you have no control over. Um, so that scene is, is really good. But the short of it is, I 100% think we have enough energy on this planet. It's just not in the right places. It's not being used well. And, and that's a point about the wind turbines as well. You know, someone said, hey, you can't just be against wind turbines. And we have a scene in the film where I, I clearly say I'm not against wind turbines. We've been using the wind forever, but it's just about using the wind badly. And uh, again, I think this waste, uh, using it appropriately, using it well, treating it like a precious commodity. You know, electricity is a magical, uh, you know, feat of science, but we treat it like toilet paper. You know, what do we do with toilet paper? We wipe our asses with it. So why are we treating electricity, which is God's gift that has lifted us out of, you know, um, misery and, and, and so forth. Why do we treat that with such, such disdain and almost disregard of value it's it's crazy really in the film we mainly pointing out the inefficiency supply chain madness and the corrupt politics on on wind turbines but there's so much more attached to wind energy and 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 how the film is stating it's it's just the tip of the iceberg um, for example a wind park needs a whole lot of new infrastructure damaging even more nature as the park itself. Yeah, and I mean, we had to be really conscious when making this film to strip it back to, uh, you know, the, the, the introduction to a very big story because we wanted to uh, have engaged the widest audience because many people didn't know even the basic facts about wind. Uh, but once you go beyond wind and, you know, solar, uh, needs to be thrown into that as well. Intermittent um, electricity sources, you d and and large in remote industrial scale uh, utility scale uh, renewable energy. You have to accept that there is an entire a universe that is attached to it. Because again, we look at just a wind farm, but a wind farm is part of a system. Uh, the electricity has to be moved from that wind farm to wherever it is used. And that's often because of the, some of the things we covered in the film in remote places, because remote places are the places where you have the least resistance uh, and you can get away with a lot of things if people don't see it. Those are over cables. All of these, uh, these cables cut through the lands. Uh, they are made from resources themselves. They have to be maintained. They end up being a tax on the system because, you know, everyone who uses electricity, usually the residents and the citizens bear the brunt of all costs. So it's really weird. You know, your friend builds a house across the street and you end up having to pay for it. You know, that's the type of system we have with our electricity distribution. So you might think it's free uh, because, you know, it has nothing to do with the wind farm. But these cables, I mean, here in Sweden, 
they run everywhere. It's almost like uh, blood poisoning, if you know blood poisoning with all the spider web of, of um, sort of uh, infection. And you just see them cutting across the, the country. And these are also, you know, 100, 100 meter tall towers uh, with vast uh, cables, very thick cables. You can hear them sizzling, so you know that they're not natural. Uh, they have their own EMF emissions, etc., cetera. Um, and it's a huge expense. And, you know, and substations and, uh, you know, then all the standby infrastructure, because whether people like it or not, and they can talk about batteries, but, you know, you, you need to think about megawatt hour capacity of batteries and megawatt hour consumption of cities, you know, all the batteries in, uh, in Australia can only run you know, uh, run the country for a minute, you know, and, and so to run it for hours or whatever you need to compensate for intermittent renewables is, is ludicrous. And of course, batteries are inefficient and they're wasteful. And every time you charge them and discharge them, you have a, a, a loss of energy. Um, vast materials go into those. It's, it's hilarious, of course, now the amount of coal and oil and diesel that is being burned uh, you know, the system that we have now and that we're moving towards is horrifically less efficient than the one that we had. And a coal-fired power station, a modern one, it has very few emissions. It has water vapor and CO2 because they're very clean now and they're very highly efficient. Could they be more efficient? Probably. But we need to just steer away from mixing up our messages and mixing up our uh, the way that we gaslight uh, various technologies. You know, coal is finite, 100%. Coal mined badly is horrific for the environment. Uh, but if you think about using what we have much more efficiently, uh, and reducing our demand. I mean, you know, I still laugh about the fact that here in Sweden, they want to, they want, we have a cement, big cement factory. It's owned by Cementa, which people think is a Swedish company, but it's actually Heidelberg Cement. It's a German company. They have a massive uh, cement facility, but that cement facility builds stuff, uh, makes cement for things that are being built that we don't necessarily need, including wind turbines uh, and wind farms. So you've got a cement work that is making cement for the foundations of wind farms, which are producing the electricity to supply the cement works to make the cement that makes the foundations for wind farms that produce the electricity for, you know, so it's almost like a Ponzi scheme. Uh, and many people don't look beyond the wind farm. They just say, oh, well, this one wind farm, well, that, that, it's not not that bad, you know, it's a necessary sacrifice, a few local people, some, some birds, but they miss out. It, again, it's, the, it's an iceberg. You know, the wind turbine is just this tip of the iceberg that you see sticking out the top. And you've got this massive, uh, you know, undercarriage of, of additional infrastructure. All of it is great for business, you know, and the private equity funds uh, who own all this infrastructure and control this infrastructure, they love it. You know, it's almost like, endless synthetic demand for your money paid for by the citizen. So the, the citizen becomes uh, a battery chicken, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, an industrial milk producing cow uh, just to feed the system. And, and these private equity houses, uh, investment funds, pension funds now are included in this. You know, everyone is taking your money uh, misappropriating it and then skimming, skimming off it, you know, they're just having a heyday because the people only see the one aspect and the film was really designed to say, hey guys, these wind turbines are symbolic as well as, you know, actually causing massive harm. Look at the symbol and then understand what it stands for. For. And then that's sort of what I hoped, at least, and, and Marina, we talked about this, is that the people look beyond and say, well, if wind is like this, what else is like this? You know, where are they telling me one narrative? And actually, the reality is, is, is different. But the common denominator is exploitation, 
uh, you know, removal of freedoms, destruction of nature, and money. What we also didn't include in the film was the promise of the developers who have a very vicious strategy and, and lure regions with false promises that the existence of a wind farm will mean an economic boost for the region. Yeah, so uh, so it's very typical at the, the beginning of a wind farm, they have to go through the permitting process. And the permitting process is, there is an acknowledgement that there will be an impact, but it's like net zero. You know, there's going to be net benefits. So please accept and tolerate the, the negatives. And they always talk about economics because money corrupts, you know, money makes the world go round. So they really focus on money because, you know, money gets you reelected as a politician, uh, money pays your bills, your mortgage, etc. So they really focus on that a lot at the beginning. And they say wind farms are amazing for business. Uh, you know, there'll be lots of local companies who will get contracts and, and that'll be great. What they don't, uh, uh, and then they always, always quote jobs. They're like, the wind industry creates 100,000 jobs or 50,000 jobs or 10,000 jobs. So there's a lot of um, positive statistics that get put forward in support of the, the application. The reality is very different. You know, the reality is that there are already well-established um, foreign concerns usually, um, you know, many of them being German, uh, because Germany leads the industrial machine. They make a lot of the wind turbines. Uh, they have a lot of the technology. They're leading a lot of the, the, the regulation. And here in Sweden, you know, they already own half the, the distribution, the grid distribution for electricity. Uh, so there's already a well-defined and well-oiled machine that they roll out uh, every single time, always under the promise of local, local, local. Then they accuse the local people of not having the skills. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. We would have used some Swedish people or some French people or some Spanish people, but the local people don't have the skills. Um, and of course, wind turbines have been built for 20 years. So you would have thought that if it is the future and the demand and it's about economics and green growth, that in 20 years, they'd have tons of people who can do all this work. So they don't have, so they build this sort of defensive uh, facades. Of course, there are some local people who do get jobs. You know, there are some people who drive trucks because, you know, it's too expensive to bring all the trucks from Germany and all the, the regulations. There are some people who uh, move material. Uh, so gravel, you know, you can't bring, it's not cheap to bring gravel from China. They'll bring the cement from China, perhaps, but not the gravel. So there are some local people who will have a limited, uh, you know, financial benefit. But again, it's like a, a drug addiction or a, a Ponzi scheme. They have to keep building wind turbines, wind farms to keep the contracts coming because the contract is only for three months. Uh, you know, you drive some trucks to bring some gravel. Well, that's only at the beginning during the construction phase. They don't need you during the operation. You know, during the operation, the only people who, so uh, let's say in the construction, there are 300 people. Uh, just as an example, uh, and these are all the people who you know, make the foundations, uh, make the roads, lay the cables, uh, put up the turbines with the cranes, etc., install them, etc. So 300 people for a period over, let's say, two years, um, not all at the same time, not all continuously, etc. And then when the wind farm is in operation, there are six people working there permanently. So a guy who does... Uh, he doesn't work there permanently, but he clears the snow, for example, and keeps the roads clear. One guy. Um, and then you maybe have five guys who are technicians who run up and down the turbines and grease nipples and change the oil and, and, and do that kind of stuff. So, you know, a 200 million uh, investment uh, uh, created 300 temporary jobs uh, for as short as a, a month or a few months, and then create six permanent jobs. So each of those permanent jobs is the equivalent of what, 30, 35 million uh, of investments. Um, but those guys may or may not be local, um, but it is, it, it's, not a, it's not an economy building uh, sort of uh, thing, a wind farm or a solar farm, because they're humanless, you know, ideally they would have no humans, right? They just have some drones that check the, check the turbines and everything is done over the internet remotely. So it's not really a people centric 
uh, and even an economic centric because these wind farms all make losses. You know, they're designed to make losses and to pay as little tax locally into the local economy as possible because you know this is all about financial engineering and maximizing profits and and subsidy mining and uh, exploiting public the public purse and taxes etc so they really don't want to leave anything locally because these things are all about the investors and making investor profits uh, and that's that's really concerning i mean we looked at uh, we looked at these wind farms uh, from a, an investor perspective, and you could clearly see the financial engineering, uh, and that is uh, you know that's why now that people are starting to notice and starting to reveal the fraud, they're now saying wait 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 we're going to give you money. So yeah, you have a wind farm. Yeah, there's no economic business, but we're just going to give you money to make you happy. Uh, and that's called bribery. So, you know, the latest tactic is, hey, you know, these wind farms are bad, but don't worry, we're gonna make you rich, you know? And that's why some people are really supportive. You know, if you're a landowner, uh, you get money from the, the wind turbines. So, hey, yeah, of course, you know, money makes you happy. But that's still ignoring all of the macro issues. It's ignoring the exploitation, it's ignoring the taxation. It's ignoring the, you know, the environmental and rural community impacts. Uh, and also, as, as we say in the film, it doesn't fix the problem. You know, we have an energy addiction, but it's not even our energy addiction. It's the energy addiction of the industrial complex, which has convinced us that we need more stuff and that we should be grateful that they are building more pointless infrastructure, more... Uh, you know, roads, more uh, skyscrapers, more factories, more mines. Uh, and they try to cover all of that up with this point about economic benefits, you know. But it's, again, if you peel it back and you could do a whole film on it, uh, the economic benefits just aren't there. And actually, you could argue that it's an economic drain to have a wind farm. So... Yeah, yeah, we didn't cover it. I mean, you know, I gave you a hundred hours of, of you know, the, the video that I had shot myself. I mean, we could have done a War and Peace 12 hour uh, documentary and we still would have only scratched the surface. You are running a couple of court cases against wind farms. How are the processes going? Okay, so um, in the film, we touched upon Björkvatnet uh, wind farm, which was originally an SCA Statcraft wind farm uh, back in 2008. They, they were the ones who then applied um, for the increasing the height that then resulted in these massive turbines that uh, were built in the end. They worked together with GE and Infravia and Windspace and Hans-Erik Flodin and others. Um, that case I, I took to the local courts. Uh, I gave a very convincing presentation together with my lawyers. Uh, the courts said that's really interesting but you don't have the right to uh, raise this objection to the courts. Uh, we appealed that to the Supreme Court here in Sweden. And back in June, the Supreme Court concurred with the lower court, didn't talk about the validity of our claims. They just said, you as a citizen do not have a right to question this. So that is currently paused and we're just working on our strategy about how to take that forward into other forums. Do we take it to Europe? Do we take it to the Justizumbud, which is the regulator that governs the justice system? Uh, so it's, it's we're, we're trying to figure out our strategy. We then had the next wind farm, which was called Huxjön. Huxjön uh, is next to Björkvatnet. These used to all be one big, uh, a big wind farm, but they broke them into small permits because it's easier to get through the system. Uh, Höxjön is owned by Jemtkraft and Persson Invest. Um, Persson Invest is a local billionaire um, who, who is quite influential around here. Jemtkraft is the local uh, utility company. We did a similar thing. We found uh, evidence of misleading and fraud. We took it to the, the, the courts, uh, said, hey, here is fraud and misleading. They said, really sorry, uh, you do not have the right to bring this case before the courts as citizens. 
Again, we took it to the Supreme Court on the same basis. Uh, together with my lawyers, we, I think we really, really had an amazing uh, case that we presented, very clear, uh, very well uh, founded in, in the legal system, because you have to use the legal system, sadly, to challenge these guys, and they know that. Uh, and the Supreme Court again came back and said, irrespective of the evidence that you present, you do not have uh, legal standing as a citizen to go to the courts. So uh, again, we're, we're stepping back to say, well, what are we supposed to do? Fraud, misleading, illegal activity. Uh, the courts won't even hear it. What forum do we have to, uh, to do this? Um, then we have uh, active, um, an active court case against um, Storbrand Quillen, which is owned by Neoion, which is one of the world's largest uh, renewable developers out of uh, France. They're building a really questionable uh, mega facility called Thunderbolt in Australia that I've been in touch with some Australians about because it's, it's going to be 10 times as corrupt as, uh, as Storbrand Quillen. But we've challenged that one. They've asked for more time because they, they need an extension to, to build it out, which means that they'll try to sneak in bigger turbines, et cetera. Uh, but we've caught that. Um, and currently that's not in the courts yet. That's pre-court when you're still um, challenging the permit with the, the local regulator. Um, we're really concerned that uh, you know, they've influenced uh, the regulator and the local municipalities to get support for that. Um, that one is, it's only 12 turbines, but they're 230 meters, uh, 200, uh, about 200 meters tall. So they're super devastating to the local people. Those were the ones, if you remember the boat scene about the village uh, and the turbines that are going to go along. Um, so that one's Storbrunkulen and Isbalin. Uh, and then we've got Björkvatnet and Boyevatnet, which are the two that are directly next to the village. They'll be within a kilometer or so, uh, 300 meter tall, uh, 50 turbines. That's being developed by Renewable Energy Systems, which is an English uh, developer that I used to, uh, I used to actually talk to them when I was at the bank. Uh, they're owned by the, the McAlpine family, which is one of the elite billionaire families in, in the UK. Um, yeah, then Sir Robert McAlpine is sort of a big construction company that everyone knows. They are currently preparing their application and we're in correspondence with them, letting them know that we know what they're doing. Um, I'm actually gonna send them the film this week uh, and ask for their comments to say, you know, can you demonstrate to us how your wind farm is not going to be as we've described uh, in this film. And then we'll have to see, uh, we've got, three other wind farms that are, uh, you know, they're trying to make bigger or trying to change that we have sitting in the background. But uh, it's a really challenging time from a, from a court perspective because I need to figure out how we can actually get access to, to justice in the courts. And I emailed a, a professor, uh, his name's Jan Darpo. He's down in the south of Sweden. He's a leading uh, mind about environmental justice. And I'm hoping that he'll pick up uh, you know, this is an example because I'm not alone. You know, the same thing that's happening to me is being replicated across Sweden, across Norway, across Finland, across Germany, across the US, across Australia. So if we can start creating precedents that can then be drawn upon in other markets, hopefully that will then give us the momentum we need uh, to, to just get, you know, it's madness that a citizen who sees illegal activity cannot take it to anyone. <laughs> What do you hope this film will do in the future? I'm really hopeful that people will uh, will do several things. So firstly, I, I, I hope they watch the film, you know, and, and there's so much garbage on Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime and, and uh, you know, mainstream uh, sort of television at the moment that I hope they just enjoy it as a, a thought provoking film that engages their mind, engages their heart and that they, they, they get something from it. Uh, if they think it's a positive film and they believe in what we're saying and they can see the, the parallels, well, I'm really hopeful that they'll share it. You know, it's a conversation starter. You know, we should be sitting around and talking about difficult topics and, you know, uh, current events and, you know, our futures. And this film is a good conversation starter. So I hope that they share it with people, particularly because we've struggled with the media. You know, why is the media not even reviewing the film? You know, it's crazy, you know, but it will change. 
So uh, to share it with people and to use it as a discussion point, I also want them, uh, I hope they use it as a tool because you know, the same way they can share it and have a discussion with their friends, if they're challenging a wind farm or a developer or a bank or whatever, they can use this film as a tool and challenge the bank to demonstrate how what they're doing is not just about money. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's easy to say it's, it's about money because it simplifies the bigger agenda. You know, uh, climate change and some of the responses, they are linked to other activities, digitization uh, and some, some of our societal changes, but keep it simple, stupid. Um, why is this wind farm that you're building that's gonna destroy nature, um, not just about money? Uh, and then they can use it to get a response from those developers and the banks and the politicians and the NGOs and the media and that will really start to, to get some, some more conversation and attention. And then lastly, and even though I wasn't explicit in the film, I wanted to, I, I'm not perfect, I'm not there, I'm on my own journey, but I'm on my journey back to nature and you know, to use nature as the foundation of, of my life uh, and also the way that our economies are built and our societies are built. And so I hope people will use the film also as a bit of a spark of innovation to say, hey, you know, maybe I've neglected or I've forgotten my purpose and my connection to nature. Uh, and, you know, I'm highly recommending that people who ask me, you know, that they read um, E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, which is 50 years old. Uh, the principles are so sound. It's not anti-technology. It's not going back to the, to, you know, the, the, the caves, going back to our caves. Um, it's about appropriateness. And once you understand what appropriate is, it makes a lot of these other topics that we touch upon the film and elsewhere much easier to understand. I'm also recommending that people read a, a book called um, Hidden Life of Trees, which is written by Peter Volleben, uh, a German forester, which just transforms your uh, worldview about nature and forests and plants. Uh, and it, it really, you know, it really brings you home and reintegrates you back into that natural system. And then last but not least, um, uh, a friend of mine, and he'll probably uh, curse me for mentioning him, but uh, uh, Giles Hutchins has written a book uh, together with uh, Laura Storm called Regenerative Leadership. And that's more of a business book, uh, but equally applicable to people's personal lives, looking back at ancient wisdom uh, and how do we reintegrate ancient wisdom back into our, our families, our friends, uh, friendship circles, our workplaces, uh, you know, our governments, our societies, etc. Uh, and so, you know, it, it wasn't supposed to be explicitly a film about nature and, uh, you know, humans recognizing our place in nature, but if that's a byproduct, uh, and then it becomes almost defending nature from these industrial pointless exploitations. Uh, maybe it also gives people something where they can say, well, actually, you know, I don't need to go to the matrix, to the digital world, which costs me money. You know, I can have my access restricted to, uh, you know, there are rules that I have no control over, cost structures I have no control over, uh, and lots of uh, negative aspects. Well, if I rebase back to nature, I get a lot of freedom. You know, my cost of living goes right down. My, uh, my worldview and world appreciation goes right up. I'm not giving things up, I'm getting things back. Um, yeah, so if that was also, you know, maybe a bit of a utopian view, but if that was something that came out of the film as well, I'd be over the moon because they criticized the film for not giving the answers. And I didn't think that that was our responsibility. And it would be really arrogant for us to say that we have the answers. But what I hope the film did was say, hey, here's the framework, you know, here's a perspective, here's uh, you know, a, a worldview that you can subscribe to for free uh, and you can find your own answers. And so you know, it's that give a man a fish, teach a man a fish. And I really hope that the film um, is the, you know, the teaching uh, or sharing experiences creating sort of collective wisdom, 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 uh, collective wisdom. Uh, and then, you know, that, that the people who are already doing this come out and help the other people who want to do this or are not doing this yet come together and, uh, you know, create community, uh, feel good, 
and realize that, you know, my, my dad used to say, and I, I kind of curse him for it, you know, are you making money? That was his, uh, his measure of success. Uh, he was a second world war veteran, you know, he had tough, tough times and, and grew up in a different time, but, you know, it's not, are you making money? It's almost like, are you living, uh, you know, a happy, healthy and purposeful life? Um, money doesn't really, it's not the motivator. It might be a facilitator and we need to work on, you know, getting ourselves a little bit more independent from, you know, financial structures, but, but ultimately it's, uh, I, I'm really positive and I see really good things coming. Uh, and the, the film is just, you know, a contributor to that really positive, you know, they call it the great awakening. Um, I refer to it as the great remembering you know, when people just realize that uh, they are part of something bigger. Every life matters, you know, it, it, the color creed, um, sexual preference, gender, you know, those are all irrelevant because we're all important in our own right. And as long as we do our best, the outcome is irrelevant because you can't give any more than your best and, uh, and we should be happy with the rest. I guess we made a very honest film where we didn't hunt enemies. I mean, we don't have enemies, but systems, right? And 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 systems can be can be bad. And and yes, people are working in these systems. In in most cases, you know, without knowing or seeing them. Yeah, I mean, one hundred percent. I mean, uh, I hope this people also give, this film also gives people the opportunity to make a choice. You know, with information. You know. There are no good or bad people. There are just good or bad choices. And those good or bad choices have consequences. And I hope that people who watch the film now have knowledge. So if you are one of the people who are doing bad things, uh, you are no longer doing those bad things um, secretly. Uh, you are no longer doing those bad things without knowledge. Uh, you know, some people said I was misled. But we are saying this is out here. Um, if you choose to continue to, to do bad things, then we really have to question, well, what do we do with that? Um, but I think everyone has the capacity for good. If you were bad yesterday, you know, you did something terrible. Yes, it is part of what defines you as a person, but it isn't what defines you as a person. It is not the thing. So bad people can be good. Equally, good people can be bad. So we also just need to be reflecting uh, with the knowledge and making sure that our children and our young people are not being fed garbage because you know sadly you can tell a child that blue is red and red is blue and they will believe that uh, so we have a great responsibility to make sure that people are taken care of and that this um, you know that the media isn't becoming one-sided and that it has an agenda. And I see lots of young people and, you know, we sent the film to Fridays for the Future, Greta's own movement. And they said, we are too busy to watch your film. And I followed up by saying, you mean out of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, young people who are part of Fridays for the Future, no one has time to watch a film that says that it has some truth and some new information and might help grow your knowledge. I was shocked, you know, uh, and, and many organizations said we are too busy to listen to an independent film, which is well researched, which, you know, is two years of work, you know, it, that surprised me. So those young people and the system, we do need to counteract and counterbalance because they are being manipulated and the film is supposed to. And that's why the media is against our film. It seems, you know, maybe they're not, maybe they're just too busy. Uh, being distracted by COVID, uh, to, to pick this up and put it out there because where is the conversation? You know, I have, uh, I use LinkedIn and social media platforms because I don't think even they are bad, you know, to their core. Yeah, uh, but we need to use them for good. So uh, yeah, I think the young people just need to watch the film and then talk about it, tell us their thoughts and then go from there. One more comment I often receive, um, this film asks for a part two, should we? You know, I, 
I think I think there is a, a need for more information and a need for more exploration. Uh, is it a part two? Is it um, a series of conversations, you know, like your bite the bullets or something along those lines? I certainly don't see this being the end of my story. You know, making the film, I can draw a line under it. I'm carrying on. Uh, you know, yesterday in Norway, the Sami people won a landmark case against Statkraft, where the permit was deemed uh, invalid because they, you know, they had breached various rights of the Sami people. You know, is that the beginning of uh, a domino effect of, you know, being able to revisit all the other corrupt permits that have been issued and and come getting the right or better outcomes? So, look, um, you know, I've spent most of my redundancy money on legal fees trying to uh, to fight the system in the system um, if people think that there is value in in more collective wisdom well let's figure out uh, the right medium and the right channels and the right format to do that you know this was supposed to start a conversation or conversations uh, so there is so much more and what people don't realize is the number of people who I have met through this process, the number of incredible minds and thinkers and visionaries and passionate, highly motivated people who aren't uh, subscribed to the agenda, uh, you know, this agenda of wealth extraction and uh, infinite digitalization and technology uh, reliance. Um, these are people who, want us all to thrive and prosper and if we can bring more of that collective wisdom out you know mariah and i i uh, i took a risk on you i think I, th I think we came good uh i would love to carry it on so uh yeah watch the space so thanks alexander for answering the questions and and hopefully we made a product which can become a tool to shift the system in a better understanding of things from whereof we can flourish in a positive way. Just right? to, to close out, um, uh, what we think we have here is, is something special because it's, it's a collective effort. You know, it's the product of all the people who have been thinking and fighting and challenging uh, across themes. You know, there are people who are defending independent science, people defending independent journalism, people defending, you know, the rights of, uh, you know, my body, my rights, uh, you know, all the, the right to education, uh, you know, unbiased education, uh, the right to be able to live freely. Uh, and, and, you know, I find that this film is my little contribution to the work that these people have done. And it should be one of many contributions. Uh, so, you know, without a shameless plug, you know, we want to take this legal process through. If there are any lawyers out there or any high net worth individuals or anyone who wants to support, um, you know, there is an opportunity to get into a process where I think we have a high likelihood of beating the system. Um, using the system, because inevitably, uh, in the absence of uh, anarchistic revolution, which, you know, I don't think anyone wants, and I don't think it's in anyone's interest, uh, particularly when you learn about the, uh, the military spending that's going on at the moment. Um, but I think that we can use the system, and then we can change the system, because, you know, systems aren't all bad. It's like the wind turbine. If you use a system badly, you know, that's, that's uh, better, uh, that's worse than not having a system at all. So, uh, yeah, so I think, I think there's lots of positive people. I just want to thank them. And I want to thank all the people who made the film possible because it's, uh, you know, I just took a risk by putting myself on the film uh, because many people didn't have the courage or the stupidity to do so. But this film would not have been possible without the thousands of people who have been fighting tirelessly trying to educate, trying to raise awareness, trying to have discussions. Um, and I, I, I wanna thank all of them and, and implore everyone else who isn't having discussions and who isn't you know, revalidating their, uh, their norms to just take a moment to do that. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll be surprised wherever we end up, we'll probably be better than where we are now. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining, and please do share the documentary Headwind 21 within your network. Send it to politicians, network developers, and to your local mayor. 
and ask them to demonstrate how they would do it better. For uh, comments on the stream or other requests, please contact us at uh, film at Thank you so much. See ya.